we said in, in communication networks, we send data from a station to another station via a set of intermediate devices, which we call switches. And there are different approaches for those switching devices to, to forward the data through the network. And we've mentioned circuit switching, based of, well, uh, developed for telephone networks, where we make a call, we place a call before we transfer data, we set up the connection or the circuit, we sometimes call it a connection or a circuit, and then we transfer data. And then we, at the end of the previous lecture, we introduced packet switching, where uh, we, in circuit switching, when we set up a connection, we essentially have a, a long link from source station all the way through to destination station. And to transfer the data, we can just transmit the data at the source, transmit the data at the source computer, and it flows all the way through to the destination computer. There's no concept of packets necessary with circuit switching. But with packet switching, we break that data into smaller chunks, we call packets, and send them one at a time. Why? Why do we need packet switching when we have circuit switching? Well, we finished on some example showing a network where A, B and C wanted to send a D, E and F through one shared link between switch 1 and switch 2. And we, we made up some numbers to say that that link shared between switch 1 and switch 2 has a capacity of 2 units, maybe 2 megabits per second. And the links from A, B and C to the switch 1 have capacities of 1, 1 megabit per second. Now, if all three of the sources want to send at the same time at full speed, they all send at 1 megabit per second, then of course we're going to overflow this link. Our link cannot support 3, it only support 2. And with circuit switching, what we do is before we let A, B and C send their data, they first set up a connection or a circuit to the destination, and that process of setting up the connection involves this switch S1 checking. Can I support the connection from A to D for one megabit per second? Well, the switch should know what's currently reserved for this link to switch to. If there's nothing currently reserved, it supports the new connection from A to D. Then B connects to E, and that's accepted. Because we have a capacity of two, and we currently have reserved for A to D, so we can allow B to E. But when C tries to connect to F, switch one is going to reject that connection request. It's going to say, you're asking for one megabit per second, but my link along the path to the destination, this link to switch two, I don't have enough capacity to, to support that. So with circuit switching, the connection from C would be rejected. A and B are guaranteed one megabit per second, even if they don't use it, they can, uh, that's reserved for them. C cannot send anything. That's the problem with circuit switching is that even though A and B are guaranteed one megabit per second, if they send less, right, they, that's the upper limit they can send, but if they send less, then we waste some resources. If they send a small amount, then the link between S1 and S2 goes unused, and that's inefficient. So with packet switching, we send packets one at a time and it allows us at the switch, say if we do not reserve any resources, and under the conditions where A and B and C send at varying rates, sometimes A sends a lot, sometimes B and C are sending very little, and then sometime later they may change. So the amount that they want to send varies then by sending it as individual packets and then at the switch one gets those packets and sends them out on the link, assuming the total coming into the switch one is less than two, then we can deliver all three of the source's data. But for some periods of time when the totals of what's com coming into S1 exceeds two, A is sending 0.6, B is sending 0.8, C is sending 0.9, then with packet switching what happens, we save some of those packets which come in which we cannot send in a queue. 
The other ones are sent out at 2 megabits per second. Those in the queue are then sent after that. So when we have some, some time available, then we send those in the queue. So eventually the data gets sent. And this is very efficient, especially when A and B have varying sending rates, because we only need a link from S1 to S2 of 2 megabits per second to support all three users. Whereas with circuit switching, we could only support two users. Uh, the two users would get good performance, but our network would be inefficient. So this is the main advantage of packet switching, this network efficiency. The disadvantage is that when A, B and C do want to send at high rates, such that we do exceed the total of two, the packets have to wait in the queue. So one bad thing is that those packets will be delayed in the queue, and this contributes to queuing delay from source to destination, another delay component. And the other problem is if, if they're sending at a large rate for a long period of time, eventually the queue may fill up. Our queue is full of packets waiting to be sent. We send another one in, we can't put it in the queue, so the switching device, S1, drops the packet. Our data is lost. So we need ways to deal with that. So that's packet switching versus circuit switching and the main advantage of packet switching. And in the internet today, we make use of packet switching. The, the internet is built upon packet switching. Because many of the applications we use in the internet have this nature of the amount that the user wants to send changes over time. Sometimes your computer is sending a lot, sometimes very little. We, there are two types of packet switching, datagram packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. Datagram packet switching is the simplest. Source has data to send, split it into packets, send them. And those packets are treated independently by the switches in the, in the communications network. Meaning, if I send packet 1, 2 and 3 and the switch gets 1, 2 and 3, it doesn't treat them as if they are connected with each other. So it may take different decisions on how to treat the packets, even though they are from the same source. The packets normally have headers. So we have data plus some overhead of a header to tell the switch where to send it, who's the destination. An alternative to datagram packet switching is to try and use the benefit of packet switching, this network efficiency, but also some of the benefits of setting up a circuit, like reserving some resources in advance. And that's where they arrive at virtual circuit packet switching. Like circuit switching, before we send data, we establish a connection. And after we finish sending data, we tear down that connection. And when we send our data, we will follow that same path where we've established a connection. We'll go through a quick example of that. So we've gone through datagram packet switching. We just send the packets. They, they go through the, the network. With virtual circuit packet switching, before we send our packets, we send a special packet to the destination saying, I want to set up a circuit, a virtual circuit, or a virtual connection with you. And once they accept that, then we start sending our packets. The benefit of virtual circuit packet switching is that we can, again, inform the switches on the, on the path that we're about to transfer data. They can uh, reserve or prepare capacity for the, the packets that are coming. coming. So an example, our source wants to send data with virtual circuit packet switching. First, a circuit is set up or a connection. So the packet is sent through the network and it chooses a particular path. Once that path is set up, then we send our data and it follows that same path. Each packet goes along that same path. Whereas with datagram packet switching, they may traverse different paths. Because in this case, virtual circuit packet switching, the switches know this packet belongs to the connection that was established 
between this source and destination and they know to send it on that direction. This can be of benefit to say do things like uh, pro provide some performance guarantees, set up a connection and we're going to guarantee you or, or try to provide a performance of one megabit per second for your data transfer or to give preferences to, to uh, some, some source and destinations so you give priority to some data compared to others. All of Dr. Steve's packets going through the network get high priority. All of the students' packets through the network get low priority, as an example. This can support such features. The problem with virtual circuit packet switching compared to datagram packet switching is it's more complex. We need to set up a connection at the start and the switches along the path need to store some, something in memory about that connection. So that can be, uh, add significant complexity when we talk about in a large network we may have millions, tens of millions of connections through a network. Not just one person sending data but hundreds of thousands of people sending data through the network. We need to set up these connections all in advance and that, that takes a lot of resources. We're, that's about all we're going to say about switching. I'll give two, two comparisons with respect to performance and then we'll move on. Uh, which one's used today? Well, they're all used in different scenarios. So telephone networks still use circuit switching. Uh, virtual circuit packet switching is used by some internet service providers or uh, different technologies in large networks. Uh, but a very important one of the three is datagram packet switching because the internet that we use every day is built around this simple protocol or simple technique of splitting our data into packets and sending them one by one independently of each other. Datagram packet switching is used in the internet. So to finish, let's just compare them with two examples with respect to the, the performance, especially timing. First, let's look at the packet switching approaches, either virtual circuit or datagram, and talk about how big the packet should be when we're sending across a pass. And we'll go through four, four cases of different packet sizes and we'll talk about, well, what's the, the trade-offs that are involved here. The scenario we have in this example is we have a link or we have a path with three, three links. So we'll, we'll look at the, three ca the four cases, but the scenario, if you look down the bottom, the path involves the source X sending to switch A to switch B and then on to the destination Y. Three links in this example. So let's just note that. We're trying to send data from X to Y. And for, for this example, I'm going to put some numbers to that. Uh, we don't need them, but it may make more sense when I add some numbers. Let's say the links, every link, has a data rate of 8 megabits per second. Three links, all the same data rate. I'm just choosing the numbers so they're easy to calculate, so we can do some quick calculations of transmission delay. And let's say I want to send a total amount of payload, total data, from X to Y is 1,250 bytes. That's how much I want to transmit from X to Y. And we're going to consider four scenarios, four different packet sizes. A data packet is 
is made up of a header plus payload. And we're actually going to consider four different payload sizes. And to keep it simple, we'll keep the, the header fixed and we'll set it at 100 bytes. So every packet contains a 100 byte header. And then we're going to consider four cases. Well, if the payload is this size, how long does it take to transmit this data from X through to Y? And that's what the four pictures will go through. In the first case, let's assume that we have a large packet. We have one packet, PKT, short for packet, and the payload of that packet is the full 1,250 bytes. So that's the first case we're going to deal with. So what we're going to do is we take all of our data, put it in a packet, attach 100 bytes, and then send it from X to A. When A gets that packet, it's going to send it to B. And when B gets the packet, it will send to Y. How long does it take? And for simplicity, let's ignore processing delay. All right, there is processing delay, but we will not add it in here. And even propagation delay. Let's say the propagation delay, the links are so short that the propagation delay is very, very small. So let's focus on transmission delay. What is the transmission delay of our packet? Well, the numbers I've chosen hopefully uh, work out to be nice ones. If I bring up my calculator, our packet size, we have 100 bytes of header plus 1,250 bytes of payload. So that's the total packet size. So convert the bits. And what's our data rate? 8 megabits per second from X to A. So I'll divide by 8 megabits per second. I want to find the transmission delay of a packet. It's just the packet size divided by the data rate. Divided by 8 megabits per second, or by 8 here, gives me 1,350 microseconds. That's why I chose 8 megabits per second, because when we divide by 8, we get the exact same number as the, the packet size, just in microseconds, not bytes. The transmission delay of one packet from X to A is 1,350 microseconds. Let's write that down. So let's look at our first picture. The picture is showing the time it takes. So time increases as we go down at time zero at the start. Time zero here. We start transmitting. The time it takes to transmit includes the time to transmit the header, the blue box, followed by the data or payload. The total time to transmit we finish at time 1350. We just calculated the transmission delay for one packet. It's 1350 microseconds. This is from X to A. When A gets this packet, it looks at the header and realizes, OK, I need to send to B. So then A starts transmitting that same packet to B. And that's what the, the next part of the diagram illustrates. At that, so we'll ignore any processing delay, say so it's uh, quite small, and the propagation delay. So we receive the packet at time 1350. We start transmitting, transmit the header, the payload. 
It takes another 1,350 to transmit, brings us to 2,700. Just add them together. Then B has received the packet and B transmits onto Y, taking another 1,350 microseconds. So when does the data arrive fully at Y? What is it? 4,050. We transmit from X to A and then from A to B and then from B to Y. And the time to transmit one packet takes 1,350, so we have three transmissions, three times 1,350. Total time to deliver the data from X to Y is 4,050 microseconds. Any questions? That was just the setting up the scenario. That's a simple case. Any questions on the numbers or what we're doing here? All we are doing is transmission delay. I assume propagation and processing is, is very small. So what we want to look at is what if we change the payload size? What if we have a different size packet? Well, we can't have bigger. We only have this amount of data, so let's try smaller. And that's what the next picture shows, a case where we have a smaller payload. And then we'll ask how long does it take to transmit? Let's consider we have a payload size of half the original case such that we'll have two packets to transmit. There's a payload of 625 bytes. If we have 1,250 bytes of total data to send and we set the payload in each packet to be 625 bytes, then we need two packets. We're going to have to transmit packet 1 from X to A and then packet 2 from X to A. And the transmission time, every packet has 625 bytes of payload plus 100 bytes of header same as before, 100 plus 625 gives us 725 bytes. Sent at 8 megabits per second will take us 725 microseconds. If we divide by 8 million bits per second, the data rate. So what happens? The timing, we start at time zero. We transmit the first packet, the first half of the data. It takes 725. And then X, immediately after transmitting the first one, can start transmitting the second packet and take another 725 and finish at 1450. But in the meantime, X sends the first packet to A. At this time, A has received the first packet, and then it starts receiving the second packet, but because A is a switch, it has a link from X into A and a link from A to B. A can start transmitting the first packet to B at the same time it's receiving the second packet from, a, uh, from X. So here, at also time 725, we see A is transmitting packet 1 to B. And if we follow that through, at time 1450, A has received packet 2 and also transmitted packet 1 onto B. A starts on packet 2. B starts transmitting packet 1 onto Y. It takes another 725. We add on 725. And then to finish, at this point in time, B has received packet 2. B has already sent packet 1 to Y. 
So all that we need to do to finish is B sends packet 2 to Y. Takes another 725, finishing at, if you add up, 2,900 microseconds. What's the point here? What's the, the conclusion we can make so far? comparing the two cases. With the large packet in this particular case, the total time to transfer our data from X to Y, the same amount of total data, took 4,050 microseconds. With a packet half the size, or a payload in the packet half the size, it takes just 2,900 microseconds. This second case is better. We transfer the same amount of data from X to Y in a shorter time. Everyone can see why it's better? Why do we get a shorter time? It's, it's this parallel receiving one packet but at the same time sending another on the next link. We can't do that when we have a one large packet because when we're receiving the first one we've got nothing to send, send across the second link. That's the problem of having that one large packet there. By having two packets, I get this scenario in some cases where I'm receiving one and sending another at the same time. That's in these cases. So we save time in total time to do that. The next case is we have even smaller packets. And we'll choose a size of 250 bytes. If the payload is 250 bytes, total is 1,250, we need five packets. Every packet has 250 bytes plus 100 bytes of header, taking us up to 350 bytes, giving us a transmission delay of 350 microseconds. So we'll not write all the numbers, but we start transmitting at zero, the first packet, then the second, third, fourth, and fifth. But while the second is being sent from X to A, A is sending the first on to B. And while the third packet is being sent from X to A, A is sending the second packet on to B, and B is sending the first packet on to Y. So we have these three parallel transmissions, three transmissions through the network happening at the same time. Well, to transmit one, it takes 350. We can find the total time by just adding up how many transmissions. So we have one, two, three, four, five. plus another one here and another one here. So seven transmissions in total. Seven times 350 will bring us to the end. Seven times 350 is 2,450. Even though we have five packets, to send from X to A and then in five packets from A to B and five packets from B to Y, there are actually 15 transmissions in total. Some are happening at the same time. So the total time is less than the previous two cases. Better again. Last case, smaller packet. 125 bytes per packet. giving us 10 packets to send. A transmission delay of 225. Remember we have the header. 125 bytes of payload plus 100 of header. Same scenario arises. We transmit the packets but now we have 10 to send and quickly go through. We see that we have some in parallel we transmit 10, 
plus another 2, 12 times 225 is 2,700. The total time in this fourth case, with the smallest packet of the four cases, is 2,700. Worse than the third case. The third case is the best in this example. It takes the least time. Why is the fourth case no better than the third one? What's the problem? Why is case four worse than the third case? What is it? Why is four worse than three? You can you see in the picture? You can what's happening in case four? Why does it take more time? Same amount of data being sent, it's still 1,250 bytes, but you may notice that we have a larger proportion of the header to be sent. We have 10 headers to be sent, whereas in the previous case we only had five. So we have this extra overhead of not transmitting the data, transmitting the header, and that with smaller packets we spend more time transmitting header. And it turned out in this case that making the packet small enough so that we have 10 does not give any benefit, any more benefit than having a five packets. So we need to consider have the packet small enough such that we can have parallel transmissions through the network, through the path, but have it, don't have it too small such that the header uh, is too much. So it depends upon what is the header size compared to the packet or the, the total packet or the payload size. And it also will depend upon the link, the number of links in the path. In our example, we had three. If you had four links, you would have a different scenario. We, we really need enough packets to fill up all of the links in the path. With two packets, we had times where we were not transmitting on some links. With five packets, we got times when we're transmitting on all links at the same time, all three links. But when we went up to ten, we also were transmitting on all three links at the same time, but we spent a lot of time transmitting the, the blue header in this case. That's the disadvantage. So this is just an illustration in a network now. We can still look at the delay from source to destination, but the packet size may have an impact upon the total time to, to deliver our data. Any questions on this example? This was just for packet switching. The last thing we'll do to compare is to look at, again look at the total time to do the data transfer, but also include uh, the connection setup. So compare with the three approaches. We will not go through calculations in this one, we'll just explain in general. Again, we have source wanting to send data to the destination, some same amount of data in all three cases. There are three links again. The nodes are labeled one, two, three, four, not X, A, B, Y, but three links. And in the first picture, we use circuit switching. So this is for circuit. The middle picture, we use virtual circuit packet switching. And the last picture, we use datagram packet switching. And what we care about is comparison of how long does it take from when I press start, I want to start my transfer, I, I press start, send, send file. 
from when the source nodes can start until the destination node receives the entire amount of data. How long does that take? And we're trying to compare those three approaches. And again, it will depend upon many factors, but we'll talk about the general trade-offs. First, in circuit switching, before we can actually send data, we must set up the circuit or set up the connection. So I press start here. I don't send any data. I send a special message through the path to the destination that sends back a response. And then I can send my data. So there's a delay in setting up the, the connection or circuit in circuit switching. And it's similar, almost the same, in virtual circuit packet switching. So both of these approaches have this initial delay, this startup delay. Once they've set up the connection, then the data can be sent. Now, if we compare the data transfer phase for packet switching, the, the virtual circuit packet switching, where we have, say, three packets, both of them look the same here. We send a packet, like in the previous example. We send a packet. When it arrives in its entirety, we can send it across the next link and then the next link. And it depends upon the number of packets and how long that will take. So the packet transfer for the data in the middle case of virtual circuit packet switching and the right case of datagram packet switching takes the same time here. With virtual, uh, sorry, with circuit switching, the left case, the way that virtual that circuit switching works is once we set up a connection, we don't use packets. We just take our data, like a file, and transmit it at the source node. And it goes to the first switch and essentially passes through that first switch and then goes on to the second switch and passes through because those switches are configured. Whenever the data arrives, it just sends it immediately out. It doesn't have to wait for the packet to be received in its entirety before it sends. The signal essentially passes through the switch. That's why we see the data here looks different for the packet transfer. With circuit switching, it would take less time for the same amount of data. There will be overheads of the packets and waiting for each packet in the two rightmost cases. For circuit switching, there's no delay there. We just transmit the data. So the question is, which one takes less time from when I press start until we get the data at the destination node? The first two also have an ACK packet saying we're done. Ignore that for now. We focus just on the time it takes to get the data. Well, it will depend on which one's faster. It will depend on how much data, how many links, uh, how to set up the connection. But some general we can observe. First, easy one. Virtual circuit packet switching will always take more time than datagram packet switching. With the same amount of data under the same conditions. With datagram packet switching, we just send the packets. With virtual circuit packet switching, we set up the connection and then send the packets. So there will always be an initial delay of setting up the connection here. That is significant if we don't have much data to send. Let's say I only have 100 bytes to send, one packet to send, not three, or not 300. Then the delay for virtual circuit packet switching is call request, call accept, send one data packet. A large proportion of the total time is setting up the connection. And that can be bad for our overall performance. I press start on my application. It takes some time to set up the connection and then a very short amount of time to send my data. I might as well just use datagram packet switching, send the data straight away. It's much better for the total delay. Now comparing to circuit switching, Circuit switching versus virtual circuit packet switching are similar. The main difference is with circuit switching, the data transfer phase is much faster. 
We don't have to wait for each packet and process and send it on. And there's no headers which we have in the packets. So circuit switching can be faster when we have a large amount of data. We just transmit it. If we have a large amount of data, we need many packets. The more packets, the more header we need to transmit. So there's more overhead. So circuit switching is good for a large amount of data when we continuously send. Another trade-off we can observe here that there's some delay of setting up a connection. And that can be bad for performance if the amount of data we want to send is small. But as the amount of data we want to send grows, if the user data is very, very large, then the time to set up the connection is just a small proportion of the total time. And it's not a big problem for total performance. So that's some of the trade-offs there with the different approaches. Setting up a connection is OK if you've got a lot of data to send, not OK if you only have a small amount of data to send. Using packets is good for network efficiency, but introduces some overhead for the header and processing of the packets. And I think we'll, we'll finish on switching there. Uh, we've looked at briefly the, th the different types of switching and some of the performance comparison. There's a table that summarizes some differences between them. Uh, but we will not go into this detail to, to see the differences. Some we've talked about, others are new, but uh, I'll let you browse through that. Uh, we will not ask too much detail about the three switching techniques. What we want to do, though, is come back to the original case of getting data from source station to destination and solve a problem that we missed, which is how do we choose a path from source to destination, which is the next topic on routing. <laughs>